<laughs> okay, so, um, yeah, I didn't think an introduction was necessary. This is a small enough room that everybody knows who I am, so. Um, Chris asked me, we're, we got a slide for that. Okay. Uh, I'll be the next one, so I'll introduce myself. Chris asked me to do the keynote. Uh, well, let me, let me tell you who I am first. I'm Corey Watson. I'm VP of Operations for Infinity Interactive. Uh, I've written quite a few Perl modules. You've probably, hopefully, maybe used something that I've written, or at least contributed to. Uh, I've been contributing to open source stuff for quite a long time. Um, goes back a long ways. Linux, Perl, um, all manner of things. All around, awesome guy. Um, Chris asked me to keynote last year. I think it was more out of desperation because um, he was tired of Jay complaining that somebody, that he was on a talk opposite me and nobody came to Jay's talk. Uh, then he should just write better talks. And he wouldn't have that problem. But, uh, but instead, he asked me to do the keynote. And uh, I said, well, great. What, what do you want me to talk about? The hide on here is talk about whatever you want. I'm like, well, our keynote's supposed to have a theme. Uh, is there something that this conference is about that I can use as a basis for a keynote? Uh, I will talk about that later. So for an entire year, I've been thinking, what in the world would I want to talk about at a keynote? Uh, I like to talk. I like to complain. I like to bitch. I like to tell people that, that things are good and that they're bad. Uh, but it, it was hard for me to think of something that I could write for a keynote because I felt like it needed to be something interesting. Um, I think that Larry gives really great keynotes that when you, you listen to them, you're not really sure where he's going or what he's talking about. And over time, he kind of develops this interesting story that he kind of weaves into something <coughs> cool like Pearl. I felt like I needed to do something interesting, um, maybe something a little unexpected. I don't mean like, you know, crazy things are going to come up on the screen. I mean, you kind of expect that it's going to be about Pearl and technology and, uh, you know, keynotes are setting a tone. They're usually at the beginning, but we do this one at the end. Um, so maybe completing a tone. I, in the process of looking up keynotes, I watched a bunch uh, that were technology related and even learned that keynote is from a cappella singing. It's the, the tone they make at the beginning to set the song, which I thought was kind of cool. So doing it at the end is technically wrong. It's one of the one way to do a keynote, I suppose. Um, and then lastly, of course, this is a Pearl conference, so I figured it should probably be <coughs> Pearl. Um, at least in some capacity. So hopefully I'll weave some Pearl back into it. And I want to involve you. So Pearl, or this, this talk will also be about you, I hope. Um, so in the process of thinking what I could possibly talk about, I, I had a lot of thoughts. I thought about talking about careers, about working in this crazy business, about uh, how you could be better at it or worse at it, I guess. Um, I thought about talking about modules themselves and haranguing you for not using the modules that I wrote to do all the cool things that your modules did that I think I can do better. Um, I thought about uh, a lot of things. And in the process of thinking about them, I think that I managed to put together a weird story similar to the ones that I've seen Larry do. So I wanted to try my hand at it. Uh, one of the things that I ended up thinking about in the beginning was about programming languages themselves. And it got me back to spoken language. English, really, because I'm, I only speak English. I don't know any other languages. I took French in high school, but for those of you who took class in high school like that, you're really just kind of memorizing. You weren't really learning how to speak fluently. So it didn't really do anything for me. I didn't learn anything interesting. There are some people I know, um, we've seen it today, people who are bilingual, who actually take the time to convert their computer over to speaking another language. Um, they've taken the time to learn a whole new, yeah, there you are back there. We all saw um, who take the time to learn a new language uh, by choice and change up their day-to-day -day habits to incorporate this new language. I have friends whose um, spouses are not native English speakers and who have learned it, and you know they've had to pick up this language to speak it. I have friends who are not originally from the United States and speak other languages. And something I've found is that uh, people who speak other languages that I've been around tend to express things in very interesting ways. They don't talk like I do, which I find, I did, novel I think kind of cheapens it, but I find it very interesting to, to hear the way that other people speak. And it got me thinking one afternoon about thinking. Uh, what language do I think in? I only really know English, so I think I think in English, because that's the only way I know how to think. And so I started asking. Um, I'd say that I did all this research ahead of time, but I think this was like, 
Tuesday. I started asking. <laughs> And so I asked around, everybody who was on IRC or AIM or whatever, um, I did actually do some research, but it doesn't come up until later. Um, so I started asking, uh, you know, what, what, what language do you think you speak in? And it's a really weird question to get. I got some really kooky answers. But when I put all the answers together, I got some really bulletproof statistics. And these statistics said that people who spoke multiple languages tended to tell me that the way that they thought the way that they worked through problems in their head, they tended to do so in a way that wasn't really tied to their spoken language. Um, I had one friend who said that he thought kind of in English, but that he did his math in Persian. Um, I had others that said, oh no, I think visually, so I have to have like this video diagram in my head. Or uh, others that said, no, it was completely above all of this, and that they, it had nothing to do with language whatsoever. It was thought. It's an idiot. Don't you know that that's not in language? Um, what? <laughs> so it got me curious because that means that thinking perhaps is language agnostic. And so I think I think in English only because I've only ever spoken and I've only ever learned it. And so as I married this up with all these people that I knew who I thought had really interesting ways of presenting problems to me or speaking with me or whatever, I realized that their multiple languages gave them a lot more interesting perspectives on them. And so I started to wonder if, are all these languages giving them more mental tools that they're capable of expressing these things to me or working with me in ways that I don't really expect? And I got a little jealous, honestly, because I, I one of my friends in particular, I think he speaks something like four or five different languages. He was born in another country. He lived in some couple of other countries. His wife is from a completely different country altogether, so he's had to learn to speak to her. And so he speaks something like five languages, and he's also the most interesting guy to speak with. And so now I'm, I'm disappointed because, damn it, I only ever got to learn English. I've managed to get this far in my life and not learn any other languages, and I'm sure I could probably do it. But again, I thought of all this on Wednesday, and I didn't really have time to learn some other language. So I couldn't <laughs> test any of this crap, but I'm just shoot it off the hip for you. So I got upset because these people have more mental tools to solve or accomplish these tasks than I do. And that disappoints me, because I'm one of those people that if I find out I'm not good at something, I want to work really hard to get better. And so as I'm thinking about thinking, I realize that if I'm just thinking about thinking, my job is really programming, so what about programming? What if I only knew one programming? How would I think about programming? What if I only knew programming? So I started thinking about what was at the root of all of my thinking, which was to think about diversity. And that what exactly is diversity? And why exactly is it important? And so I started doing some research. By research, I mean, you know, had multiple Wikipedia tabs open. Um, <laughs> but the first thing that I, that I stumbled on is, uh, was genetic diversity. Because I wanted to know, does this diversity that I see in people's speech really equate to something measurable in the way that they behave and the way that they act. And so I looked into genetic diversity, and I learned that there are two different types of genetic diversity. I'm going to make a lot of squishy little assumptions and put things together here because I did all this. Uh, I don't know anything about genetic diversity, really, but I read a lot on Wikipedia. So <laughs> if, if you happen to be involved in the study of diversity at your job and you actually know what you're talking about, then just don't be the guy in the audience. Just talk to me later. It's cool. I'm not really going to say anything about diversity that's going to be earth shattering. So what I learned was that there were two types of genetic diversity, at least for the purposes of this talk. There were internal and external. So internal diversity is the, interni the, the, uh, the diversity that we have within this room, considering that we're all Perl programmers. We are all different. We all approach things differently. We use different modules. We solve problems different ways. We, uh, some of us use you know, completely different things within Perl. But external diversity would be things that aren't Perl programmers, like trees and airplanes and you know, Pinewood Derby cars and all these other things, but usually things that are somehow related. So they may be Ruby programmers or Lisp programmers or what have you. Um, what I found interesting about this type of diversity is that uh, in a study by the National Science Foundation, I found this quote that if any one type of diversity is removed from an ecosystem, then the entire thing falls apart. It's not good enough 
for us to have our own internal diversity. We often worry about are there enough, is there enough diversity in Perl that when you know some web framework comes along, it's going to make us all obsolete because we only knew this one and we weren't diversified. Well, it's also important that we aren't the only ones that we consider. There are the people that are outside of us, the external side. And so I thought that was kind of interesting because I didn't really expect that. I was more turning the camera in and thinking about our community, that our diversity was very important. But the diversity of the groups around us is equally important to our health. And if they're not out there and contributing to what they do and we're not watching them, then we're all just going to collapse and job is going to run everything and we're all going to live in cubicle farms working on health care somewhere. It's a constant threat in Nashville, just for the record. Uh, so after looking into genetic diversity, I looked into other types of diversity. And the next one I found is business diversity. And again, I'm kind of sticking to this yin-yang thing. There may be more types of diversity, but I'm just going to stick with two from now on because it fits my slide. <laughs> so there are two different types of business diversification, two different things that cause a business to want to diversify. The first is defensive. So if you make cars and you realize that you're going to lose your business if you don't make a car that meets certain fuel economy standards or hits a certain... Uh, uh, price points that you can bring in new people, well, you're going you're gonna to go out of business. You've got to have that. So defensively, you'll diversify. You'll start making a new product or put yourself into a market so that the, your core business succeeds. We've seen a lot of this because companies will realize that they're, they're you know, let's say who's done it, music, movies, everybody else. Oh, no, there's a new thing. We must protect ourselves and diversify by offering a completely crappy alternative to something that you can all do really easily. Doesn't always work, but sometimes it does. Um, there's also offensive, which is to completely jump out and take on a whole new market. Get out there and sell something you've never sold before. Maybe your brand is really well known for being easy to use and, and, and friendly and good for value, so you jump in for making computers like somebody like Apple to all the rumors we've heard about them making televisions. I don't know if they're going to do that or not, but that seems like a pretty offensive move. And so this is pretty neat. I thought, okay, well, I'm on this whole diversity kick, and uh, I've learned about internal and external. Now I've got defensive and offensive, and these are all cool. So I dig around some more, and I say, well, what other kind of diversity is there? This is probably the one you probably thought of first. When I say diversity, if I say diversification, I know i got at least one guy back here nodding about uh, diversity. Um, in investing, it's important. You know, so I, I, I kind of made this one up, but offensively and defensively, um, you know, you may protect your investment defensively by investing in tried and true stocks that are or securities that are good because they, they, they survive things like recessions, like soup and whiskey or something like that. Because everybody hates that in recession. Um, offensively, though, maybe you're maybe you're young. You want an aggressive portfolio that really goes out and goes into emerging markets and all these other things that maybe could go bad, but they get really good ROI. So it's important that I diversify that I spread my money out and make sure that I'm putting it in all the right places. I'm getting nods if it's on. So, a pattern is artificially emerging because I molded my dad into a pit. <laughs> <laughs> Not good scientific method, great for keynotes. So I kind of broke this down into offensive and defensive, mostly because I really like the ligature on the double S. <laughs> I was going to use like internal and external, but that just looked way too good. So, this, this whole yin and yang thing got me into another interesting thought. Uh, something else that I thought, I, I read a quote sometime during last year, I think, that people need to do a better job of understanding that your ideas don't define you, you define you. And something I've learned, as I'm starting to get older now, is that life really isn't binary. Um, the, the whole, I feel this way, so if anything ever comes up that's contrary to it, I must just deny, 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 so that I am not known as the guy who said that this thing was this way, but it really turned out to be some other way. Uh, we spend a lot of energy defending things that we think are good. I mean, like, Perl is the best programming language, and then if anybody comes up with a reason that it isn't, then we just, oh, you know, that's totally not relevant. This is why Perl's really great. We spend a lot of time doing this. And so one of the things I, I think about when I... Um, when I think about life not being binary, is that I am a programmer, but because life isn't binary, I know that while I'm a programmer, while I think I'm a pretty good one, 
I'm not the best programmer. That's a great call. I'm not the best programmer. And that's a hard thing to say out loud. It's hard to stand in front of a room and be asking a keynote and say, you know what, I'm probably not even close to the best programmer in this room. Uh, but it's something that I've learned uh, that actually is very freeing. It's sometimes nice to be the guy in second place because there's considerably less pressure to be in second place. Um, because you don't have to worry about the next time you do that thing, making sure that you did it better than everybody around you. And that's kind of cool. So I know I'm not necessarily the best programmer. And I know that I'm not necessarily going out every day trying to make myself better than everybody else around me. But I do need to pay attention to becoming a better or better whatever. And how is it that I can go from being a programmer to being a better programmer? I'm never going to be the best, which takes a lot of pressure off of things. But how can I become better? Diversify. Found a connection. So now two talks that I wanted to give are now connected. So we'll thread here. So I need to diversify. So how can I diversify? Well, there are a couple of cool suggestions here on how I can diversify as a programmer, work-related. Um, they're listed here, but I'm going to go through each one of them individually. Uh, the first way is to work with non-programmers. That probably sounds scary. That's probably the last thing you want to do. If you could define your perfect job, if someone said, I will pay you to do any damn thing, I bet almost every one of you in here, if you are a programmer, would find a job that didn't involve talking to people that work for them. You probably write tools for developers and then just release them to other programmers. Uh, but the job that we do is not all about the technology. And taking the time to work with people who aren't programmers actually solves a pretty big problem because we spend a lot of time arguing and fighting and creating resistance with people that don't do what we do. And so by sitting down and taking the time to say, you know what, this week I'm going to work with non-programmers. I don't really believe in New Year's resolutions because it's just another day to me. I like to think when I wake up every day I need to make resolutions. And I like to think that if I had a lot of opportunity to work with non-programmers, which as a consultant, I don't get as much as I probably would like, um, I would probably shut up and do it. Because it would probably be a good thing because I've said so in myself. Um, it's also a pretty good ego check. Because it's pretty easy, especially today, in this day and age, when everything is you know, the internet of things, as uh, Robert Blackwell likes to say, um, all the, or I guess a lot more people than Robert, so I get my point. Um, I, there's a book, I think, that came out this last year called Program or Be Program. I mean, these are some pretty heavy stakes. And so to think that we are way ahead of the curve, because we can do this. If the internet apocalypse comes and we have to, you know, reassemble and build ourselves up, crap, we don't have any real skills that are translated into meat space. But still, we could probably find a way to build some cool stuff because we have those tools. Uh, well, hanging out with people who don't care if you have those tools is actually kind of cool. Again, you, you don't have to be the best at everything. And so knowing that there's someone around who's actually really good at something like marketing or finance or operations or you know just general business crap that you don't want to care about, uh, those people are nice to have around. And you don't have to shun them just because they don't know a lot of stuff about technology. Uh, Another thing you can do, work with other programmers that aren't the programmers you work with every day. I mean, I work with a bunch of smart guys. They're some of the smartest guys I know, but I, I'm kind of in an echo chamber when I work with them. Of course I think the things they made are great because I manage to hang out with them every day. I think they're smart guys, so the things they make, I think they're smart. I think they're good because they're smart. It's easy to dismiss working with other programmers because other programmers don't do it the way that you do, or they don't do it the way that I do it. They don't have stars on their bellies. If you've seen that old Dr. Seuss uh, cartoon. Um, there's an old saying that is heavy and open source that the more eyes there are, the shallower the bugs are. That's a true statement, but I like to think that the more eyes are different that are looking at the bugs, the, the even more shallower these bugs become. I mean, you've all got that guy probably that you work with that's really good at, at, that, at finding that bug. You're sitting there, you've been banging your head against it for 30 minutes, and the guy's walking by, eating something, you say, hey, Frank, come here. Take a look at this. He walks up and he goes, yeah, you left your semicolon off, you didn't try tiny. You just walk away. <laughs> you know, you've always got that guy. The more people you get around you who are very different than you, the more opportunity that they're going to see things that you didn't see. So working with programmers who you don't normally work with is a really great way to diversify and get you in, new input. 
It also kind of helps prevent the little not invented here syndrome. It's very easy to sit in your little gilded chamber at the top of your white ivory tower on your big horse and I've written the best code and mine's better than everybody else's because I never give anybody else a chance to tell me that theirs is better. But having other people around all the time, again, it takes some of that pressure off. The thing that you wrote doesn't have to be the best. It can just be good at solving a problem your way. And if you incorporate somebody else's feedback, that's fine too. And you know, if, if, if tomorrow the thing that you wrote turns out to not be the best solution anymore, that's probably not the only hit you're ever going to make. I bet you'll write something good for some other problem a week or two down the road. Month. Maybe never, I don't know. But at least you have to stay in the Another way, whole new languages. I mean, when was the last time you went out and found something that was completely ridiculous, that had nothing to do with what you did every day? I mean, we all, I mean, a lot of us these days are writing a lot of web stuff, but when was the last time you wrote something completely different, a language that didn't even work anything like Perl? I grew up as a C programmer. And so I, I like C languages. When I use something that isn't C, I just get pissed off. I'm like, why did you have to do it all different? Why can't you just do it C? Why can't there be semicolons? You know, why, can't, why do your statements have to be weird? So the weirder the language, the better. But alternately, the more similar the language, the better. There are languages that are very much like Perl. And all you have to do is go take a look at them, and you'll find that there's actually just a very small difference between the way that Perl works and the way that that language works. And then you may get something really cool out of taking the time to look at it. Something else you can do is whole new technology. You build a lot of web apps. When was the last time you built a desktop application? When was the last time you sat down and tried to write some, you know, whatever it was? I don't, I don't, I don't even write desktop apps. I don't even know how anymore. Uh, many, many, many years ago, I wrote Swing desktop apps <coughs> for healthcare. I, I don't even know if you sat me down anymore if I even know how to start. That's pretty bad. If you write a lot of web apps or, and you, or you write desktop apps, what about daemons? Have you written any event-driven code lately? That's pretty weird stuff. How about high availability stuff? When was the last time you wrote something that you had to continue to make it to work even if you unplug it or, or do whatever? I mean, that's pretty serious stuff. And if you don't work in it a lot, you don't know those approaches. So in the process of looking at myself and saying, well, I'm a programmer, but I'm maybe not necessarily the best programmer. I said, well, okay, I've got to crack, I've got to find some way to link this back to Perl. So, well, the programmer thing works, so Perl is a programming language. But Perl probably really isn't the best programming language. What was important to me is that there isn't really a best programming language. Programming languages solve problems. Just like tools, well, they don't necessarily fix things, but they work on things. You don't have a tool belt that's only got a hammer in it. Some of us do, and we go around beating things like that's the only solution to the problem. But... <laughs> Hopefully, you realize that there are a lot of tools to have in your arsenal. So if Perl isn't the best programming language, then I had to seek out some data that proved either that it was or it wasn't. So I went to the, um, I don't know how you pronounce it, the T-O-B thing, T-I-O-B, everything's called lies. Okay, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, man, that C just went way over there somewhere. Nah, that happened. Anyway. Um, close on your suit. No, I'm not. <laughs> cool. It was it was there yesterday. I don't know what happened. Um, anyways, yeah, 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 sure. Okay. So we've got all these programming languages that show up on the lives, and these are all kind of interesting languages. Um, so I stopped and I took a look at every one of them, and I wanted to know why I hated it or liked it or, or whatever it was, or if I even knew how to pronounce it or what it did. And so I kind of just worked my way through them all and just kind of read up on them and, and tried to not be biased. It's very easy to pick on every language up here because if you go to a Java conference, all these other languages are going to have people talking bad about them. Or if you go to a PHP conference, and, you know, we like to pick on some languages like PHP and Java. Um, but there's a lot of cool things about a lot of these languages. Because if you happen to use these every day, you grow to love certain little features. Or even if we just kind of ignore that and just look at them um, objectively, there are some very cool things about them. Um, Java is easy to complain about because it's overposed and it's got all this junk in it and everything. But the class library is pretty nice. They've got all this stuff at your fingertips. You don't have to go install anything from CPAN. You don't have to go figure out well, what's the right implementation of this type of thing because it's already kind of there for you. It's got some pretty cool threading stuff built in. The bytecode thing's kind of nice. It supposedly runs on any system. I just went forward. I didn't mean to. Um, so, my hands up. 
Uh, PHP, that's an easy one to pick on, but you know, the way that you run PHP and get it up on the server and stand up, that was pretty cool. It helped people get into the language. It's why it was popular. There are a whole lot of functions that are there, but they're there. I mean, that's, I guess that's good. <laughs> I, can't really, I don't really know P I haven't used PHP in so long that I, I, I couldn't really come up with a lot of good stuff about it. But they actually have anonymous functions now in the last year. There you go. That's a good thing. Did you know that? <laughs> you know, I mean it's easy to just get dismissive of these things. No, 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 PHP sucks. PHP losers. But you know, there's actually some cool stuff there. And there are a lot of damn people working on it. So by that notion, there's probably some people making some pretty cool stuff, and they're probably going to be watching what everyone else is doing and catching up. Uh, Objective-C, that's an easy one, because Apple has had this great resurgence over the last few years, and people are actually writing Objective-C again. Objective-C does some neat stuff. Um, I can't really tell you much about it. I love that it has named parameters. That's my favorite part. But, um, you know, there's, there's just cool stuff there. If nothing else, they've made an interesting way to kind of keep C relevant, and they're definitely doing a lot of work with it. Been a lot of work with LLVM and Clang. I mean, there's some pretty cool stuff going on. Uh, Lisp. Uh, we're going to talk a little more about a little more about Lisp later, so I'm not going to dwell on it. But it was still in the index of the of the top A grade languages according to you know whatever stupid data they use. But again, it supports my keynote, so I'm just going to pretend like it's not one. Uh, SQL. It wasn't specific about SQL. It was actually transact SQL and PL. Uh, I've always, always heard it called PL SQL. I don't know what the correct, correct pronunciation is. I don't know that it matters. But it, if you work at a place that puts a lot of business logic in the database and writes a lot of stored procedures, that stuff is not just select room, blah, blah, blah. I mean, there's a lot of cool stuff in there. Um, C, of course, if you, if you don't know C, you haven't written it, uh, it's still in everything. You still pretty much have to know it uh, if you're going to get down into the guts of anything. Um, so I'll jump around a little and go to C++, which while mostly video game stuff, I mean, some stuff like uh, uh, Mongo is written in C++, so there are still some interesting things that are not just in the video game space. And then, of course, C Sharp, which is easy, again, to dismiss because it's made by Microsoft and all this kind of stuff. But there's Mono, and you can run it on a Linux box, and you can play with C Sharp, and there's probably some interesting stuff. I'm not really a language wonk, so I don't really know what all the great, cool features are, but I do know that using these languages will help you grow as a developer. And so, I mean, JavaScript, that one's under our nose. And there's a lot of interesting stuff in JavaScript. I mean, it's prototype-based and all this other crap that completely confuses me, but knowing that kind of stuff makes you a better program. And there's Ruby and Python. And I could go on like this all day. We could all probably stop and, you know, cover things that are interesting. I have a funny story about Pascal. I was supposed to take it, and my first programming language was basic took a class in high school to kind of reinforce it, and then they offered an early morning class to take Pascal before school. It wasn't even during the day. You had to show up early and all this other stuff, and we show up on the first day. You know, I, I probably imagine I was doe-eyed and so excited about this future of computing to learn Pascal, and and I'm standing there, and this guy comes around the corner, and we're like, oh, come on, we can start, we're going to learn. Sorry, kids, your teacher's not going to show up. She's found guilty of perjury and won't be teaching for the rest of the year, so I never learned Pascal. <laughs> so something that I thought was kind of interesting this is you don't really need to read it it's not important what the data says because I'm just going to make up some stuff to go along with it but what I found interesting so this is like this is Java up here and you know how popular it's been over the years and it's trending down and I don't know some other crap but what I thought was kind of interesting the languages that are at the top they're kind of going down the languages at the bottom they're kind of going up we're kind of getting worked up in the middle. It's not good enough anymore to just know one program. Language. You used to could say back in these days, you could go into Java and just say, I know Java. Pay me $150,000 to sit in your office and write interfaces and hand it over to the plebe so that they can implement them for you. You can get away with that. These days, not so much. People realize that that's, you know, there's all these other cool languages coming out, and it kind of worries me to see some of my language is kind of getting lost in this mud here because there's so many of these, and these are just the grade A languages according to to Yogi, whoever the hell they are. Um, so, how many of those languages do I know? How many of them do you know? I mean, that's that's a lot of programming languages, and to know any of them well is is many many you know the whole like ten thousand hours of practice to master a thing. I mean, how many hours have you spent? <coughs> 
But really, it's worse than programming languages. That there's way more to it. I mean, just things like the type of programming language that you're using, how the language functions. This was the uh, popularity of languages by category, which was object-oriented, procedural, functional, logical. I don't even know what logical is. I, I have no idea what that means. I don't know what the hell it is. Whatever. Sure, great. That's <laughs> awesome. That's something I need to go home and figure out now because I look like an idiot in front of all you people. But that's okay because that was part of this talk. It's okay for me to get up here and say, I don't know what any. I, I mean, I don't know what some of this stuff is. I remember procedural. Um, <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, that's cool. Functional. Yeah, neat. Um, you know, but do you know these? Do you spend time with these? Obviously, some of you are familiar with Prologue, and the ones that didn't say anything, you're just coming to me. But, you know, that's interesting. What is that? If I knew that, would I be better at what I'm doing? Probably so. There was also one for static and dynamic, which I didn't, it's kind of a stupid thing, one went down, one went up. There's only two of them. But, you know, it's, it's kind of neat, because it's <laughs> false duality. There's not many, there's no static, there's no dynamic. It's, it's a spectrum. And yeah, we're all just... People. We're all just spinning around. Right, exactly. <laughs> for second round. But how much time have you spent with, I mean, we're in a dynamic line. How much time do you spend with static stuff? You know, we kind of depend on dynamic as a job if we're Perl programmers by day. Uh, you know, how many static languages have you messed with? Do you know the differences? You know, knowing one of them helps the other. I know that Firefox 9 had, like, the type inference stuff added that made JavaScript faster, and that was to get more static y. It's kind of cool. So, some interesting languages that you could maybe add to your collection. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these. This talk could have been an hour long, but I don't really think it needs to be. I think I'm making my point pretty well. Um, Haskell, everybody's probably a little familiar with because of the Pugs project. But Haskell's a pretty cool language. You should go out and take a look at that. There's a connection there because of the involvement with Perl 6. Um, Erlang is pretty neat. Uh, it was made to do some really weird stuff, some stuff that you don't deal with in the day to day. It was made to run like phone switches and all kinds of interesting stuff like that. I mean, when was the last time you wrote software for a phone switch? You know, that's a whole different world. It's a level of uptime. It was called carrier grade at one point. You know, that's cool stuff. Um, Scala, which I refuse to pronounce the other way because it sounds stupid. Um, Scala, I just don't like it. Um, Scala, makes me feel better. But Scala is a very interesting kind of hybrid OO and and functional language that runs on top of the JVM so that you can compile it and run it anywhere. It's very cheap. You don't have to go and get some fancy tool that you don't know a lot about. You can just write this program. You get Scala to put on top of it, and it runs anywhere that Java does, and that's kind of cool. So you can run it anywhere. Closure, which is a Lisp dialect on top of the JVM. We thought that was a good idea, but it's interesting. There's a web framework for it called Composure, which I think is cool because they spell it with a J. I mean, if nothing else, they get to do that kind of cool stuff. Uh, then OCaml, which uh, if you read about it, it's just, it's just flat out neat. There's all kinds of interesting stuff in that whole ML world that I think is really fun to read about. Uh, what's my next slide? Okay, right. The one thing that I can say about interesting languages, this is by, I, I think that a number of people who I've spoken to as much as I could about this without revealing this whole talk, agreed with me when I brought this up, but if you want to get into some interesting language so that you can really kind of rewire the software in your brain, just go learn Lisp. You don't necessarily have to write anything in it. You don't necessarily have to even know it. I don't know this. If you showed me Lisp, I'd say, oh, there's, there's a cons, and there's, there's some Lisp, and the program's data, and yeah, I mean, to anyone who doesn't know what you're talking about, I sound like I'm smart, but I don't really know this. But I read enough of the book that it changed the way I worked in Solid. It broke my brain, is the best way that I can explain it. And it, when I put it back together, the way I wrote Perl wasn't the same. Is that a, a YouTube or a? Yeah, no, a uh, higher order of Perl is like that as well. Okay, well there you go. Something else that you can add to it. But Lisp for me was the biggest bang for my buck. I, I tried out a lot of different languages and tried to read about them um, and, and, and even write some stuff in them, but Lisp was the one that definitely got me the, the best. Maybe it was just that I read it at the right time. Maybe I kind of opened the, you know, the floodgates and that this was the first thing through, but that one really did it for me. So anyway, Perl conference. Let's get back to Perl. Um, Perl, what my presenter have to say? No. Yeah, so uh, Perl's always kind of felt like a bit of a melting pot to me. Um, and Perl's really kind of diverse. Uh, it was originally, a bit when Larry threw it all together, he was basing it on things that we're all familiar with if we use units. If there was no Perl, we'd still probably know a lot of Perl. 
because a lot of the stuff that makes up its core came from tools that we're very familiar with. It's very C-like when you write it out, uh, based on things like set and off. Um, something that I've said a lot in the past is that Tim is stupid, because it means that people that are trying to come into Perl have no way to know how to get anything done. But I, I've realized that really that's really kind of what makes Perl stay around. Because if there weren't people that were you know, working on one thing and then other people working on something similar but different or maybe completely contrary and doing it some other way. I mean, we all remember inside-out objects and other stuff like that. And now we've got, like, people keep chopping letters off moose and doing things. And I don't know what the hell any of that's even about, but I do know that Perl does that. And that's helpful. And if it wasn't for Perl being so flexible and allowing that kind of idiocy, good shit wouldn't come out the other side. And that's an important lesson for me, because I usually prance around saying that Tim Towdy is bad. So, but I'm not the best programmer, so what do I do? <coughs> CPAN is also pretty diverse. There is so much amazing crap on CPAN. It is full of crap. But you can usually learn something interesting go, by go looking at a module that's crappy. Because the way that people write Perl is interesting to me, because it's so bad. But that's okay because I'm sure somebody thought that about mine too. And if I go back and look at the modules I wrote years and years ago, I mean, I've got dozens and dozens. So if I go back and look at one I wrote 10, well, not 10, I didn't have any up there then. But, you know, five, six years ago, I mean, I've come a long way. And so, I, I think. So, you know, Perl's a pretty diverse place already. And it continues to be very diverse. I mean, just at this, just at this conference, I've seen things that I did not know existed until this conference. And that makes me happy. Uh, some uh, some internal diversity that we've got, uh, you know, there are a lot of web frameworks now that I, I guess you, I, I only use one of them. I won't bias anything by saying which one it is. I'm sure most people know it anyway. But I mean, they all, they all seem to be pretty good, and and people get shit done with them. And that's really what matters at the end of the day. And it's healthy that we have many of them because we can borrow or steal from one another depending on which, you know who it is or what they did. Um, for any given thing out there, you'll always find in any event version of it. And, and that's weird and interesting. I think that's cool. Uh, there's moose and all the derivatives that I don't know a damn thing about that whole moose, moo, mo, mo thing. <laughs> I don't really care. Um, it's neat. I'm sure some cool shit's going to come out the other side. Something will come out better and maybe we'll start using it or it won't and moose will get better. I don't know. And plaque's pretty damn neat. I mean, that brought a lot of interesting stuff because a lot of stuff that used to just be contained up in the top of modules at the high end has now been broken down and stuffed down into the bottom so that our top software can get slimmer and easier to use. So if you want to talk about diversity, um, not just like in straight up Perl is diverse, but diversity as far as ideas coming from other places, a really easy way to have that conversation is just to single out Moose. Because everybody knows the story at this point. The Moose was inspired by a large number of external programming languages like beta and Google. Lisp and all that crap. <laughs> That's interesting. That's cool. But we all know that already. We've all talked about it. That was not an impression of you. No. That just, that's the voice. <laughs> I imagine that voice when I read the website. <laughs> Moose was inspired by, you know, like the commentary, the voiceover guy, and all that other stuff. But instead of looking at the way that Moose was inspired, I thought it would be a little more interesting to look at the people, or the person, at least in this case, that created Moose. And so, in talking to Moose's author, uh, he didn't major in computer science. He's an art major. Uh, he painted. Drop out. Drop out. Drop out. Whatever. <laughs> My talk. <laughs> My talk. Uh, he, his first programming language was, of course, simple. I mean, we all, we all have a story like that. He started out with basic and all that other junk or whatever. Um, but his next language was JavaScript. And in writing JavaScript, you know, back in those days when, you know, it was wrote the web stuff, didn't have things like jQuery and whatever. In picking it up, he started to notice the things like the prototype stuff and all this other kind of weird, cool crap that JavaScript actually has. I mean, JavaScript is not this little sissy language that just does DOM manipulation. There's some pretty interesting stuff in there. The fact that it's contained within a web browser is what's weird about that. The, 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 all the rest of the stuff is just some grade A, straight up language fuckery is going on in there. It's kind of cool. So next, the next language he goes and picks up, a to 95. How does that happen? I don't know, but I think we're all kind of glad it did. Because downhill from there, this is the trajectory you get down into. I mean, I don't even know what some of this shit is. I don't like to do it. 
Hmm? Oh, I know you linked me to it. I didn't care to read it. Again, no real research. Off the cuff. Best stuff comes that way. But this is some neat stuff. And this to him was completely normal. Because he didn't know. He wasn't constrained by the fact that he picked up basic and then he learned C and then that's the way programs work and you write them that way and tunnel vision. Blinders to the rest of computer science. Didn't happen. So this, thought this is how everybody worked. Thought, well, I'm dumb if I don't know these things. I've got to know these things. This is so amazing. All this cool stuff. You know, that's pretty neat. And so in talking to him about it, a quote that I got that I thought was, again, to bring this back to Pearl. After a month or two of playing with Pearl, I started to really like it. And within six months, I had really come to appreciate all the crazy shit that Pearl made possible. So again, back to my Tim Towie thing. I mean, if, if this crazy shit wasn't possible, I probably would have stopped writing Pearl a long time ago. Because writing standard Pearl, I mean, you all remember writing Pearl before, whatever it is you use, Moose or what the hell ever. You know, that sucked. That was bad. It was so much work to write all that boilerplate. And it's all gone. And not only did you just get rid of some kind of boilerplate code, we got concepts that we never even knew. I mean, we none of us had written some of this stuff that exists now. There's a lot of cool stuff on top of what Moose has given us. All the not just attributes and and types and roles, and there's all this great stuff in here that we now take for granted that came from all these play crazy places and the language crazy soup crap that somebody else figures out that I don't want to. So, other than Moose, I think another great poster child for diversity in Pearl is Plaque. Everybody loves Plaque. All hail Plaque is one of the quotes that I got when, uh, when I was asking for some help with this talk. And if you don't know where Plaque came from, um, Plaque and PSGI are almost completely copied from something else. It is totally unoriginal. Basically, just ripped off from stuff that already existed. Uh, from Python, with WSGI, RAC from, from Ruby. So this wasn't even ours. We, didn't, we, just, we, just, we basically stole this from somebody else and just implemented it our way. And that was cool because everybody else was doing it too. And now we're all better for it. I feel that it started a bit of a renaissance in the Perl stuff because now you know, we've kind of been able to spread out kind of the cool stuff that we're making and we put it in all these different places. We've got middleware now and uh, you know, a bunch of other junk that I didn't write down examples for. Oh, I actually wrote a quote here. By taking HTTP and reducing it to its simplest form, it unifies the APIs for web servers and frameworks and middleware. I mean, if you think about it, everyone was trying to build, to make HTTP high and get it down at the bottom and not worry about it. But with Plaque, we kind of took that little kernel of HTTP and said, all right, when you get a request, you return a response. That's it. And then now let's build. And that's a pretty powerful idea. And we stole it from somebody else. If we hadn't been paying attention to them, if we didn't have someone like Miyagawa out there trolling other people's things, just like a shopping basket and putting them in, <laughs> that's what the guy does. <laughs> he goes around, he finds great ideas, and he puts them there, and then he writes them, and then he gives them to all of us and lets us bask in the awesomeness of <laughs> So we talked about Moose, we talked about Black. Another person I, I talked to was Rick, or JBS. And Rick is. At the moment, at least, I haven't looked at the leaderboard, but he was the number one, but he's always in a race with, uh, with Adam Kennedy. Or he's still one. He's still, still one, okay. So, as of right now, he's still number one. And so, I thought it would be interesting to talk to him about Pearl, because as someone who just vomits modules constantly on his fan <laughs> and, maintains them. and maintains them, oddly enough, if you reach out to Rick and you have a question, you want to talk to him about something, he will talk to you, usually, on um, Thursdays. <laughs> So, you know, very cool guy, and I said, Let, let's talk to you about programming languages and thieving and getting this diversification and stuff into your world. And I got a bit of a different view from him. Rather than getting kind of down into the guts of languages, he tends to kind of just stay on the edge. He kind of looks at languages from the outside to see what they've got going on. He likes to really try to identify what a language is good at. You know, when somebody sits down to write a programming language, they're not trying to necessarily at least in the ones I think that are kind of successful, they're not trying to solve everyone's problems at the same time. They're trying to solve a distinct subset of problems that this person has, and or this group has. And they're trying to make that problem easy. So he likes to try to find what it is they're good at. And sometimes I find something I want to bring back with me, but more often than not, I don't. And I thought that was interesting, because in talking with Steven, he's always finding cool shit that other programming. And this was kind of an opposite view. It's like, you know, I don't really find that much, but I sometimes find these little pearls. And so, you know, it's not all rainbows and sunshine. Sometimes you'll go out and you'll find a programming language and you'll suck at every damn thing. And you won't have learned much, but every once in a while you learn that little thing. And it's really important. So, I'm probably going to end up coming up a little short in this talk. Or in this talk. That's okay. Uh, 
we're kind of running behind you. <coughs> so now, how does this relate to you? So I said I wanted to bring this back to you. I've kind of been hinting this entire time that you should get up off your ass and work on something that isn't for a little bit. And when you're done, maybe you can come back and help us out. But what's important about you and the thing that you should draw from this, if there's one slot that I want you to pay attention to, diversity makes the mind grow strong. It's like working. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's how strong that is. It weakens the, 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 the grip. Then. Yeah, the, it weakens the grip, increases the strength of the mind. The important thing is that it's kind of like mind muscles that you're working with. You get out, you learn these different views, you, you learn these programming, programming languages, these approaches, these things. It doesn't even necessarily have to be programmed. Go and learn anything. Go pick up a hobby. Go, go get into woodworking. Then you'll start using the word dovetail more often. That's what people that work with wood say. Or plumbing, you know, and you'll talk about caulking things or what the hell ever it is. The point is, if you go out and you learn to do something completely different, the more different sometimes, the better it makes you at things you already did. Because it gives you a whole new perspective, a whole new spin on something that maybe has become a little bit dusty in your head because you don't have to think about it very much. So, to sum up a little bit about diversity here. Some of the things we've learned. We've learned about internal diversity. The, uh, the fact that even inside of the things you do every day, the things that are normal, the things close to you, it's important to have some uh, entropy in that, if you will. It's also very important that you get some external stuff going. Work with people who don't do what you do. Get out there with people that do something wildly different and get them into your circle so that they can help you. It's also important to be offensive. You need to strike out sometimes just because, you know what, I, I'm good at writing Perl today. I'm good at that. I did good. I'm going to go write something I suck at. I'm going to go pick up a language I've never worked with before, and I'm going to give that a go. Because you've been riding this high of being good, now this ride the level of not knowing what the hell you're doing. At least it gives you some perspective, if nothing else. And sometimes it's okay to practice a little defensive. Perl's been dead for how many years now? <laughs> You know, maybe you should think about that. Maybe this is not a very good career choice for you. Maybe you need to look at another programming language. It's good for defensive reasons if you can't justify it for offensive reasons. So things to do. Step outside your silo, whether that be working within the department that you work on, the project that you work on, to bring it down to a really fine grade level. Or maybe it's something really large, the city that you live in. Maybe you spend too much time in that city. Get a new perspective. Work outside of the people that you work with, the friends that you work with. Of course they think your stuff is great, because they think you're great, if they're good friends. If they're bad friends, maybe they think all the stuff that you do is crappy. They just don't tell you. In which case, that's kind of friendly, too, because there are a lot of people here that will tell you that they suck hand though. <laughs> so uh, it's also important to get outside of your, your group of colleagues at the office, to get outside of the team that you work on, even if it's a completely voluntary open source project. Sometimes it's better to get outside of those group of people, because they're, they're too focused on that one thing. Um, it's also, I think, cool to get a non-computer hobby. I bake, and I think it's, I think it's fun. I'm terrible at it, but I'm getting steadily better. And it's, it's actually a lot like programming in some ways, but I think, given time, you'll say that about almost anything that you pick up, because a lot of us are kind of wired this way to be programmed. And so stepping out and doing something that has nothing to do with programming at all, you'll probably find ways to relate it, and you'll bring that back, because you'll start thinking about your programming like you think about your baking or you're making like your program. So just let it wash over you. Though. That's what's important. Let the diversity change you, because that makes you better at the things that you're doing, or at least makes you more diverse, which if you were bad at the other thing, at least you accomplished something. Also, I, I really think that this one's important. Go learn this. If you're a programmer, I think it helps. You don't have to do much with it. Buy the book. Paul Graham's book's really good. Learn about it online, whatever. Just go pick it up. Read through it. Let the recursion wash over you. Let the recursion wash over you. It's all right. It's not going to be that hard. You don't even have to come out. I mean, I, I, when I first picked up some of these languages, I felt like I had to know them. That I couldn't sit down and have a conversation with some of the brilliant people I work with and spend time with at these conferences because I didn't really know all the eccentricities of all these things. I couldn't sit down and say, well, you know, the frozzling of the Waz job in the, in the rigmarole, I mean, that's just not nearly as cool as the wiggle flaps and whatever, it doesn't matter. The fact that I know enough about it that it makes me better, that I can kind of bask in the stupid knowledge that you've all accumulated, that's pretty cool. And it makes me better as a result. So then, when you're done with that, if you still think we're cool and you want to hang out with us, bring the fruits of that labor back to Pearl. Because you can take all that cool stuff you've learned and you can bring it back and you can make Pearl better. And that's why Pearl is still around. Because the fact that we can do things more than one way 
and that Perl lets us get away with it. We can take all these really cool ideas, and we can bring them back, and we can start pushing them into Perl, and Perl adapts and it grows just as we adapt and grow. And the important thing is that you're around things, be they people or tools, that grow with you. And so it's important that we allow Perl to grow, we grow with it. And then you can also, while you're out there poking around, slumming it with these other programming languages or whatnot, you can tell them how great Perl is. Say, oh, well, you know, that's really bad and it sucks that you can't do it that way, but you can do it in Perl. <laughs> Maybe you'll get a few of them to show up at, at your conferences. Uh, most importantly, the thing that's fun about it, and again, this kind of links back to the whole life thing, the fun is in learning the diversity and getting out and seeing all of these different things that are happening, whether it's traveling or programming languages or eating at weird restaurants you've never eaten before. It's the diversity that's fun. It's the journey that's interesting sometimes. And that's pretty much everything else.